right, so welcome. Um, Frank, hello, everybody. We're doing a short interview on, um, on leadership with Albea. Uh, my name is Tim Eagle. I've, um, I'm from Albea Coaching, and I'm, I've written a book on leading with Albea that's uh, coming out in May of this year, 2020. And in that book, I did an interview with uh, Fred Matthijsen, uh, who's uh, worked at uh, Apple and Nike, and also worked with uh, Obea as a senior director. I thought it was a very interesting interview, and I wanted to share like a bit of that interview and uh, uh, share it with you today in this online interview. So Fred, maybe you can tell a little bit about yourself. Let's just get started with Great, thanks. Uh, as Tim mentioned, name is Fred Matheson. I'm an Australian-born, American-raised Dutchman, so a bit of a Heinz 57. Uh, living in California, I was raised in a family-run business, uh, selling uh, pet supplies to pet shops in Southern California. Uh, back in 1980, I joined Apple Computer here in Europe. I worked 17 years in various supply chain functions. Learned a lot at that moment in time about MBO, Management by Objectives, AQM, which was Apple's total quality management system, and a lot of work around ISO 9002. I then moved over to ADAC Laboratories for two years. ADAC was a company that manufactured and serviced uh, nuclear gamma cameras. Uh, interesting there was that they were the recipient of the Malcolm Baldrige Award in the USA for their TQM efforts in the medical field. And then last, for the last 20 years, I worked for Nike in various supply chain functions, technology functions. Um, and my last role was actually Senior Director of Global Operational Excellence. And in that role, we did a lot of work around lean. Uh, we had a program we called NLS, which was Nike's logistics systems, which was very much lean based and was being rolled out around the globe. And part of that entire effort included the Obeyas, which is what we're going to be discussing today. Cool. Thanks. So um, for people who are not familiar with Obeya, Obeya means big room in Japanese. Why Japanese? Because basically, first of all, it was documented and started uh, at Toyota when they were developing the Prius. Uh, the Prius was a new car at the time, new type of car, which had to be built from scratch and also be delivered within timelines that were just impossible at the time. So the lead engineer, Takashi Ujimaya, needed to really rethink also how am I going to do and lead this project. Um, and I need to reinvent not just how we build cars, but also how we do projects and how we lead our organization. Now, we're not building a Prius and um, we're not talking about using an Obea to build a product or doing a project today. We're really talking about how to use Obea to lead organizations. So then we're really looking at the broader spectrum spectrum of what are what is our purpose who are our customers uh, what are we really trying to achieve with the organization and how do we really want to envision our strategy and implement that we're also looking at how do we deliver value as an organization do we do projects or do we do key services and processes that we deliver what do our value streams look like and how do we uh, measure the performance of our system that produces these results for our customers also, we're using the Obea to quickly respond and act on things that are happening in the organizations. And of course, we're really using the Obea to identify, see problems with that visual management that we're using. And by exposing those problems, we can start structurally improving them in order to get better results, deliver more value and achieve, um, execute the strategy and achieve our purpose. So with that in mind, we're going to talk um, uh, with Fred uh, about Obea. And Fred, the first thing I'd like to ask you is, is why did you get started with Obea? What happens that you thought, okay, let's, let's, let's do this? Yeah, as a manager, uh, especially a manager in large uh, corporate American companies, um, you know, I was searching for ways to simplify complexity. Uh, when you work in a large American corporation, uh, the companies are normally very highly matrixed, meaning that you have managers, uh, directors, vice presidents at various levels in the corporation, be it global, be it ge geographically, be it functional. And um, 
you, you get a lot of signals uh, and a lot of conflicting information requests from various angles within uh, the, the company. And uh, that started getting worse as time went on because we started to live in a digital world. And in a digital world, you find out that you're also just um, receiving too much data. You're getting uh, too many reports. You're being uh, requested to provide a lot of information. And again, within this matrix organization, it became very, very complex. And I was scratching my head there for a time being saying, yeah, so, you know, who do I provide what information to? And is all the information actually aligned based on the overall strategy for the company? And when I looked in the mirror, I'll sit there and go, wow, I'm having difficulty coping with all of this. I'm just an average kind of guy. If I'm having difficulty with it, what about all the employees that I'm working with, right? My teammates, uh, you know, we must all be experiencing that particular um, situation. And therefore, I started thinking about ways of trying to simplify that complexity. You know, how can I provide my team with a very clear uh, strategy, you know, that's aligned uh, and in support of the total corporate strategy? You know, how do I prioritize the limited financial resources that I have together with the people that we have? You know, how do we uh, simplify um, the strategy and set uh, clear metrics in place with supportive pieces of efforts, be it projects or other activities? And how do we report against those? You know, hey, we all live in a world with many, many reports. Do you do it daily? Do you do it hourly? Do you monthly, quarterly, annually? You know, lots of requests there in what people are ask, asking us to do. So there's there's this huge need for communication within a, a large co corporations and probably also for smaller companies. And uh, yeah, at times you sit there and look at the communications. I was, I'm saying, okay, so I'm at, it's coming from all different angles. You know, how do I whittle it back down to the essence of what we're really, really working on? And how do we do that in a honest way? How do we provide honest information you know not always that hey the world is great no we, we do a lot of work and we do some very good work and we do some poor work let's be honest about it how do you do that in a simplified way and the most important uh, for me was also how do you get your team involved you know how do you as a manager or a leader or a director or whatever title you have you know how do you embrace the power of the team and how do you get a strategy and a plan in place that involves all the team members in your, in your team. And it all sounds kind of like management 101, uh, but it's much more, it's more, more difficult. And that's where I got started on this, trying to figure out how do I once again, simplify that complex world. And so what, what triggered the first step to start with a, a, a visual management tool like, like Obea? So. Well, back then, um, you know, at the, in the Apple days, I used to, in my office, had stuff on my walls and people would come in and kind of look at it. And it was, you know, in its infancy. And it was just what triggered it for me was, uh, again, I just needed a way in my own mind to uh, have those the key metrics and the key projects just visual, not, not, not in a PowerPoint presentation on a computer, but go back a little bit old fashioned, maybe take a step back, you know, be able to look at a wall and see how everything hangs together, theoretically, you know, by doing that, you find out, well, guess what? It doesn't all hang together, right? Um, and you don't, at least I, in the way that my mind works, never really saw that through all the PowerPoint presentations. I started being able to see how things were hanging together when I was able to take a step back and to visualize that on the wall. So that started around the Apple experience that I had. Um, and then we went, uh, moved over to this company, ADAC, as I mentioned, uh, very, very, very much TQM driven. Everything was prescribed, but they also had an obey a type environment they didn't call it an obey at the time but it was a room where they had a lot of information on the walls and uh, it really started at that moment in time i started saying wow hey this is pretty cool because i'm getting this bigger picture and i'm able to look at how things are hanging together in support of the bigger picture 
And then I moved to, uh, to Nike and um, I was very fortunate to have the lean organization report into my function at that time. And I started reading some books, um, you know, and uh, as you start reading, you know, a lot of new ideas came to, uh, to mind. And in particular, a gentleman, uh, Steve Bell, had a, uh, a book where it really started to come together about how you can bring uh, lean into an organization, but also how Obeya would play a role uh, with that. So at that time, uh, together with my uh, lean manager, uh, we created a space and we said, you know what, let's just try it. Let's just start uh, with a blank wall like you have behind you right now, a white wall, and let's start putting stuff on the wall to see what that uh, uh, would give us. And where and was the location of this wall? Where, where did you get, where did you put it? First. It was uh, on the departmental floor. You know, we had a traditional uh, kind of office uh, where managers had individual offices and then we had an open floor plan for everybody else. And we were able to move desks and just create a space. And we had our facilities uh, team come in and build a wall. And so the room was actually had three walls and the entrance was just an open entrance. And we started uh, playing around. We had magnetic walls uh, placed and we started playing around with this idea of just placing the projects because we were very much a project organization at that time, just putting projects up on the wall and uh, putting metrics against those projects and providing a status update date by talking to the information on the wall versus traditional status updates, which happened through PowerPoint presentations. So that was kind of our first uh, dabbling uh, in the pool, let's say, with a big toad. Say, hey, you know, what does this actually look like, feel like? Uh, you know, is this going to really turn out to be a, uh, a powerful tool to help uh, the team get focus and report progress against the work that we're doing? Yeah. So you could have you could have just built that wall inside your management office, but you decided to really open it up, right? So right. What was your philosophy behind that? Team. It's all about team. You know, I mean, again, uh, Management 101 is all about the people. And, uh, you know, if you're a manager and you have an office, and at that time I did, later on we just eliminated all offices because it kind of built up a bit barrier between, hey, you're a manager and I'm not. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's all about the team. You know, how do you get the team members to feel that they are contributing? and that, um, that they have uh, the fingers on, or their fingerprints are on the plan and that they feel ownership. And uh, by putting, a, a, it's not only the room, the walls and the stuff on the, on the wall, it's all about getting the team members involved, uh, listening to their experience, including their knowledge into the plan and being able to communicate back saying, okay, good idea, uh, we're gonna apply it. Hey, good idea, we're not gonna apply it. It's okay to say no, right? Mm -hmm. And by being able to do this in the right way and focusing uh, on a team effort, I think everybody feels a greater sense of responsibility, right? I'm not gonna sit there and say, hey, it's, it's a solution to world hunger, it's not, right? I mean, uh, you got many different people, therefore many different views. But um, I found that it really did help the employees feel a sense of ownership um, and that I, I was also able to, not myself, I should say the team, because it was a team effort. Uh, you're able to then not only align your work to the strategy, but you're also able to define per individual what their contributions are into achieving the overall strategy of the department, therefore the function, and therefore the corporate strategy. And we did a, a lot of effort in, you know, from the very top all the way down to what we call at uh, Nike the CFE process, that is coaching for excellence. That's our annual review process so that the employees not only saw where their efforts lived in the OBEA, but they also had an annual review process that they were being um, measured and rated against their portion uh, and contribution to the overall strategy. Do you feel that that created more involvement and also you mentioned bottom up, uh, you mentioned ownership. 
but it also leads to like bottom-up involvement of people coming to you say, have seen this or have looked at that. Yes. Uh, you know, was it uh, what you would have hoped at the very beginning? No. I mean, once again, you know, this is not uh, something that's going to solve world hunger. It depends a lot on the individual. Some individuals were very engaged, more so engaged, I believe, had we not had the OBEA and the whole approach that we had as a leadership team. Um, so, yeah, I did sense that there were many people that felt more engaged in this particular environment than um, in an environment, a uh, traditional environment, where um, you know, they would get information maybe from their direct lead um, and they couldn't always place that into the bigger picture by yeah. creating a BEA in the right way, uh, where you're able to align activities to the strategy. That I feel is very important in OBEA. Uh, it also allows people to um, to come in. We used to have very uh, many communication sessions with our employees or the teams to come in and talk to them about the strategy. You know, they could see it on the wall. Talk about these metrics and which ones are performing well, which ones are not. These projects that are in support of those key metrics. Uh, you know, we, 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 we put a lot of effort into it, and I've got to believe that that made a difference to a large percentage of the employees. Yeah, yeah that, that's the reason why I'm asking, because I, what I really like about your story are, are, are a few of the key words, like, like strategy, deployment, uh, um, engagement, ownership, also on, on team levels. Uh, sometimes I get a bit concerned when I, when I read or hear about people talking about OBEA as being a control room. Um, and, you know, if you are a senior director, you start with an Albea with the image in your mind that this is going to be a control room, then you're probably starting on the wrong foot. So you're not really going to get this type of engagement because you're just going to keep pushing top down and trying to get control out of the report. So yeah. I think the, the involvement part is, is something I really, really like uh, in your um, story also in relation to, to getting people to take ownership uh, in terms of strategy. Yeah. No, I mean, the words uh, control, yeah, and not the best word to use in this type of environment. Uh, yeah, I've done a lot of project management in my career, and we would always have a war room, right? And in the war room, there, there was a lot of information in the room that was relevant to the project. You know, and I quite often scratched my head, and you know, is, is war room the right terminology? You know, uh, we used it for good or for bad. But I do think terminology is very, very important. You got to be careful not to use the wrong term, uh, especially control. If I hear the word control A, you're not going to control me, right? Yeah. Uh, and certainly, at least the way that uh, we implemented the OBEA is they were never intended to be a control room. Uh, although, you know, you could look at that. And, uh, you know, one of our employees one time in a video conference said very clearly that. If it's not on the wall, I'm not working on it, All right? You go, okay, well, is that, you know, that's a great, great statement because it means that she knows that she's being held accountable for the piece of work that's in that OBEA. But uh, you also don't want to go so far as you can't do anything else unless it's in the OBEA because that starts become, uh, could potentially become controlling. There's a lot of activities during a normal day that don't live or reside in OBEA. Um, so, uh, yeah, terminology is important and using the OBEA for the right purpose for the challenge that you as a company or a department are facing, I think is very important to really understand that and to communicate that well to the, to the teammates. Yeah. yeah, and that's probably the hardest part, I think, of, of using OBEA because you can see a lot of things on the wall and you, when you walk into the OBEA, you can easily mistake it for a control room because you see red and green and oh, we respond to red and we start punishing people, you know, you're not meeting your objectives, you start doing this or that. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, and, and it reflects nicely in the words that you're using, uh, that, that there's a lot of principles going on that you're using to launch that OBEA. And if you don't understand those principles well, if you don't have the right mindset of starting with that OBEA, it might actually turn out into a control room. And, and, and that's something I think you will not benefit much from because you're probably sticking to the same old reporting that you always had, and you will have it plastered on the wall. 
Um, and it's actually one of the reasons why our very first uh, attempt at building a bea, we had three walls and one wall was just the opening to the room because you wanted it to, uh, to be an invitation for people to walk in. Uh, we later built another uh, room where we had a door and oddly enough, that door was um, an inhibitor for people to freely walk into the room because they felt it was maybe at that time a leadership room and it was not a room that was intended for everybody just to be able to walk in and uh, get status updates. So then we uh, changed that after about a year and we moved the room close to the coffee corner and uh, it had three walls and it did have doors, but there were large glass doors that we kept open so that when people went to get a cup of coffee, you know, it was almost uh, begging them to go into the room to say, hey, what's in that room and how are we performing uh, uh, in that particular room? And the other thing that we did because of that was um, when, you, when you look at employee satisfaction, you know, how satisfied are our employees? Uh, we did different surveys like many companies do. And uh, we actually put uh, that information also in the coffee co corner on a different wall so that people could sit there and say, you know, what is the employee satisfaction rate? Why are people unhappy? Because we had unhappy people, like most people. Uh, and what are we doing as an organization to address that? Right. So that it was very open. It was very, uh, I, at least I hope it was very inviting for people to be able to sit there and look at the information because it was honest information and we were not hiding anything from people because we didn't want it to become a control room. That's what was not, never the intent. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, looking back at your time uh, as a senior director and using the Obeya, what, what, what would you summarize as the most important benefits that you experienced as in, in your position? One of the big benefits is when you start, uh, the way that we started in Obeya was around strategy. So as I said at the very beginning, uh, you know, simplifying the complexity, uh, the complexity comes from the fact that uh, there are many, many different requests coming from different parts of the organization. So the first thing it allowed us to do is to work through all those requests and come up with a clear strategy and how we as a function um, and a department aligned to that particular uh, strategy. Second thing is once you have that, it gives you a communication tool to go back to senior leadership and say, look, this is how we've interpreted everything that you've provided us. And again, there are different pockets of information coming in and it allows you to have a very good dialogue around, yeah, but we didn't mean that. And hey, that's, that's uh, in contradiction to another function. So it certainly uh, helped us do that. The, the third thing, it, and then uh, once you got that clarified, it allows you to say, okay, what are those key metrics that we feel uh, are needed in support of that overall strategy? And uh, it allowed us a way of defining those metrics and communicating that again to the organization, but also to senior leadership, that these are the key metrics that we feel are needed in order to measure our overall progress against, uh, against that, against the strategy. The next thing is said, okay, we got the strategy, we have the metrics, we're aligned there. What are the efforts that we need to do? What projects do we have, you know, based on funding and people? What projects do we have to support the overall improvement of the metrics? Because our metrics were never just a, a status update. We had metrics, an annualized path where we wanted to improve. So you want to get from A to, uh, to B. How do you make that move? And what is the work that you're going to do to make that, uh, that shift? So those are the projects that fall underneath it. And there were multiple projects and allowed us to prioritize those projects. And then you have a conversation with your employees, with your leadership team and with the senior leaders to say, hey, this is how the program hangs together for, uh, the, for the next year to be able uh, to do that. The other thing that allowed us to do was to say no. Uh, you know, it's so difficult when you are a leader and you have so many requests coming in to say no. So but, so, but why would you say no to something? Well, sometimes you're limited on funding and you're limited on people, but you're also trying to assign the, the resources you have to the right efforts. And when things come in um, and you say, well, sorry, that doesn't fit into our overall program, you can actually show a person why it does not. Does it always work? No, you know, some leaders don't take no for an answer. So you have to adjust, but by adjusting, 
you're able to sit there and say, if we have to put a huge effort into this, something's got to give, and we can always then uh, be able to do that. And then uh, the, maybe the last one is it allowed us to uh, to give honest communications on performance. And I got to say honest because you know you do not always perform against the targets that you set. And if you monitor that and you have a program in place, uh, we had a quarterly review with uh, our extended leadership team, and it was okay to sit there and say, hey, we thought we would be here, but we're actually here. And this is why we're not reaching the performance. So um, if you do that well, and I'm not saying that we always did it well, so, uh, you know, but if you do that well, it also promotes more honest communications and people should not be fearful because, you know, we always say it's okay to make mistakes, you know, but when you make a mistake, sometimes it doesn't feel good. Uh, but by having an OBEA and by having all this information on the wall in a structured uh, way, by having a good review process and seeing that it's not just your piece of work that sometimes doesn't reach the goals, there are other areas of business also, I think it, it, um, it helps people to feel more comfortable in working in that type of environment. So that sounds like it's not just affecting on a business level, on a performance level, but maybe also it does something on a personal level with people. I, w I would hope so. You know, I would hope that uh, people um, feel, uh, number one, that their efforts are being recognized in what they do day in and day in in the overall strategy of the company. Because sometimes it's tough to sit there and say, well, hey, if... You know, Mark Parker, our CEO, CEO at that time, has this overall direction. How do you, in a technology function or in a project function, how does that contribute to the overall picture? doesn't always work out that way, right? It's easier said than done, but it does allow you to, to, to do that. So therefore, you bring it back to the individual, and the individual can hopefully say, hey, when I put in my eight or 10 or whatever hours that they work per day, I understand that those efforts are contributing to the strategy of the department, of our function and therefore to the overall uh, goal of the company. And so I think that people do feel a, a stronger sense of ownership and recognition by doing it that way. Yeah, so that really addresses that, that important point to engage people that they actually have a purpose when they come to their work in the morning because they can they do their work and they can see the results and they can see how it adds up to everything. Correct. Yeah. And again, easier said than done. You know, it's, uh, I'm not going to sit here and say that we did it perfect. We did not. We, you know, it's the one thing I learned in um, using this Obeya technique is it's a continuous learning process. You know, we made mistakes. We made many mistakes in our journey, and you learn from them and you improve it. You know, and then uh, that improvement works for a while, and then all of a sudden, guess what? It didn't. You know, it kind of loses steam. You know, do you give up? No, you kind of find out why it's lost steam and what do you do different. So it's a continuous improvement process. And, um, you know, the one the, the, the obeyers that have been very successful were very successful because the team, uh, the majority of the team felt that they uh, were contributing to that. You know, and if you can get the majority of organization to feel, hey, I understand it. This is what we're, the efforts we're doing. Um, they can see the information. Um, I think that that uh, does make a big difference in the yeah. overall quality of, uh, of your day-to-day -day work in an office environment. Yeah, so speaking of the office environment, we're now in the middle of a crisis. A lot of people uh, have to work from home and do remote work. Uh, a few things that you just mentioned were really about how you put things on the wall, took a step back and then started creating context with your team, with, with senior management, maybe with other departments. So now we're all looking at our, our screens and we're using Zoom to, to communicate. So, so what, are, what do you think are the, are the challenges or, or the things that you could still learn from Obea that you could maybe apply in, in, in this um, uh, in this crisis, in the situation that we're all in? Yeah, it's a good question. And, uh, you know, being uh, part of this, um, yeah, this crisis over the last weeks is uh, I've been scratching my head a lot and going, wow, we're all locked indoors and uh, we're all looking for information and hopefully the light at the end of the tunnel. 
and um, and you watch a lot of TV, you read a lot of press uh, around the situation. And number one thing that comes out super complex, first time that we have faced this as as a world to the to the extent that we're facing it. So there, you know, there are no right answers today. I believe. I mean, I think there's uh, the impression I get is everybody's trying to find the right answer and doing their damnedest to, to, to provide it. But at the same time, um, you know, same thing as I mentioned a bit earlier, you know, in the corporate world, you've got information coming from all over the place. And, you know, so how do you, um, as a recipient, feel comfortable that you're getting the right and relevant information to influence your day-to-day, um, you know, sense of comfort in this particular situation? Yeah. So one thing I think that, you know, uh, a strong communication strategy um, where you're providing honest information to the public has got to be key. You know, I, I enjoy watching Governor Cuomo from New York and his daily updates because I'm not saying he's found the the solution uh, uh, in terms of communication, but what I do like is that you know he's very well spoken. He always, when you see him on the screen, has information next to him. So you're not only listening to the words, but you're able to communicate it to a graph or to actually read what he's saying. And for some reason, it sticks more, at least in my mind, um, than uh, you know other leaders that get up and they. Uh, they say words uh, in Holland. We have a particular minister uh, that he says, um, you know, we're doing everything, everything. We're doing everything. And then I sit there and go, yeah, but doing everything tells me nothing. You know, everything means you're doing nothing because I don't know what everything is. And when you're able to put the, the information, the key pieces of information into some kind of a visual as you speak, and you do that in a structured way. You provide the relevant information. Uh, you make that information easily accessible to people throughout time. You know, you have a timely manner of providing that information. I think that's all very, very important in today's environment to give people more comfort than what they have today. You know, if you look at testing, you know, we've talked hours about the testing strategy. There's so much conflicting information um around uh the testing uh, strategies and you know what do we need you know uh, what's available uh, when's it going to be available what's actually the goal you know when, when, I, when i thought about this i thought uh you know uh, some a3 thinking uh would be very very powerful in that if a uh, if a senior political figure stands up and is able to sit there and uh you know set a target and say, we have a goal, you know, I'm testing, you know, maybe a bad example, you know, a year from now, we want to be able to have everybody tested once a month. I don't know. You know, that's what our goal is, you know, what's the current situation? We can't do that today. You know, this, you know, this is what's currently happening, people, you know, we have the goal, you know, it's a year away, but here's how we think we're going to be able to measure against that goal over time. You know, so you can hold us accountable as a government or as a institution to reach that uh, particular uh, goal. We're going to analyze this throughout time. And as we analyze it, we're going to give you updates based on the latest data because this is going to change. Our targets will change as we learn more about it, you know, and then to, 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 to provide very clear status updates and different programs against that status update. I mean, this is what we're doing on test kits, this is how where the locations need to be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what I miss as a recipient of a lot of information that's being presented around the coronavirus uh, today with all the best intent from everybody. No one's trying to do anything wrong, but because you get so much information from different sources and a lot of the information uh, conflicts with somebody else says, there is a need uh, for me, at least, to sit there and go, if I had one source of the truth and I, I know it was well structured and I know that we have a goal and I know how we're going to get there, uh, you know, that would give me a greater sense of comfort. And if that was all true and you kind of take that away from the corona situation and you place it into an, a business environment, why would the same not apply in a business environment and vice versa? Very similar. At times, very complex, and the need is there from the employees. And in Corona, the need is there from the public. So, 
So I like that because it, it corresponds a lot with, with the ongoing theory I have of what's actually happening in the physical obeya versus what we're trying to do, and the attempts that we're making on, on like a virtual obeya and with the new crisis, that, that, that we need three things. Um, we need, if we are trying to solve the problems as to how can we still have effective obeya sessions uh, digitally, we need, to, we need to look at three things. The first thing is, is the human interaction, like you mentioned. You're looking at the person, and that person is giving the story, and they can tell you all about it because they, they are into it. They really know their thing. Uh, and you want to be able to see that person because we are people, and we need, we need to see people uh, for our interaction. Um, Secondly, is we want that information presented, like you said, you, know, you want you want you want the screen here. You want to see the data and graphic I'm talking about. You want to see my interaction screen here. And the third thing, which I really like about what you just said, uh, the A3 thinking process. Um, uh, John Shook wrote a book about that, right, in 2008, Managing to Learn, I think. Mm -hmm. um, um, and um, uh, that that you. You can have, you can easily have the people interaction. So we can open up a Zoom um, a session like this, and then we have the people interaction. Then we can also present the information here. That's fine. You can do that just like in an Obeya. You can have a room. You can put the visuals on the wall. Then you have that. But but you need the third thing. You need that A3 thinking. You need that continuous improving mindset or the structured problem solving mindset in order to to bring your team on a path where you can actually set a goal, look at the current condition, start at looking what are the obstacles to achieve that goal and, and work with that continuously. Because if, I think if you're missing that part, uh, you're, you're just freewheeling with, you know, we have nice interaction, we have a few graphics, but they don't make any sense because we're not clear about the goal or what our next steps are. We're not clear about which obstacles to solve first. Yeah, absolutely. And as you're saying that, uh, Tim, now, the one thing that I learned also in these uh, in the Obeya journey was that by defining that well enough up front, as you go through the journey and you need to communicate the progress and the changes, you've already done the groundwork because you have that structured plan in place. So you're amending a plan versus uh, trying to build the plane as you fly it. Right. And quite often, I think, and especially now with this crisis, and maybe that's just inherent in a crisis, is that uh, you get the sense that, you know, people are building the plane as they're flying it. And uh, and at times, uh, you know, that's the world that we live in and you need to do that. But there's ways that you can mitigate some of that by having, uh, you know, the A3 problem solving or A3 thinking um, up front. And therefore, as you go through the journey, you're making amendments to that versus trying to reinvent the wheel as you go through the journey. Yeah. All right, um, Fred, I'd like to thank you uh, for your time because I think this is uh, this is covering a lot on, on the basics of Obeya. And also, I have a dog here that that wants to get out of the room. That's making a lot of noise. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, I'm just uh, yeah, I'm just gonna let him out for one second. Okay. So there you go. Um, yeah, I think we covered a lot, not just on on um, you know, how we use it there, how you get started, what are the benefits, and, and a few of the challenges that we're facing today. I guess nobody really has like a complete answer to yet. That's just something that we're going to need to figure out, and uh, I'm sure uh, all of us will be exploring and experimenting towards the challenge of how do we still have that, that context, sharing that strategic information, creating involvement with teams, and, and, and easily aligning in, in a physical room. How can we do that on a virtual room? So maybe more on that later. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome.